On this Chair Chats episode, we'll be chatting with Shen Hayward about what she discovered as she devoted her time at Harvard to the science of happiness and understanding how to help others achieve it, even in the face of great adversity. But before we jump in, please subscribe and share. And if you'd like to join our community, go to Facebook and join Victoriously Living. Also, if you'd like to see more from One Leg Up Productions, support us at patreon.com forward slash One Leg Up Productions. Thank you and enjoy the episode. Hi, welcome to Chair Chats, the lifestyle talk show with a disability twist. I'm your host, Pauline Victoria. Today, we're going to talk about a topic that's really important to me and is probably very important to you too. That topic is happiness. There is no better person to talk about happiness with than Shen Hayward, who is touted as the ambassador of happiness by New Mobility Magazine. At 16 years old, a car accident left Shen paraplegic, but she's used her personal experience as a jumping off point to study the science of happiness. So sit back, relax, and let's get a little happy. Thanks so much, Shen, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I know that as humans, we strive to be happy. That's like our number one goal is pleasure and happiness. Um, and I know that a lot of times there's some misconceptions about people with disabilities and how um, someone with a disability may have a lower quality of life or have a harder time finding happiness or being happy. And I wanted to understand a little bit more about from your own personal experiences and um, as a researcher in psychology, um, what is your experience or um, discoveries about the science of happiness? That's a great question, thank you. Because as you mentioned earlier, my own uh, academic journey and now professional journey really was influenced by my own experiences with happiness as a person with a disability, with an acquired disability. And as you said, at 16, I went from uh, being in the majority to being in the biggest minority group and encountering stigma for the first time in my life. And if I had to say one thing about having a disability that leads to unhappiness, I don't think there's anything inherent to the disability experience that leads to unhappiness. It's the stigma on the attitudes and misperceptions of other folks that can lead to a lower quality of life. But my experience is that even with those forces that are unpleasant, I've never been happier. And I've found that the process of being a person with a disability has uh, resulted in so many blessings and so many interesting experiences that it's pretty hard not to be happy. And that really spurred my own interest in the science of happiness with a disability. Uh, when I was an undergraduate at Stanford University, I first became exposed to the power of psychological research to understand and to shed new light on these, uh, what well, once were thought of as intractable questions about the human experience, and to really dive into assumptions and explore whether or not they're true. And I, was, I remember reading an article about uh, spinal cord injury, which is my, um, my disability, and uh, and how it led to something like three to four times higher rates of suicide, greater substance use, uh, greater depression. And it just didn't fit with my experience, nor the experience with any of the people I'd met during the rehabilitation process, all of whom led very full lives and traveled around the world, had great looking boyfriends and girlfriends and drove great cars and all of these things that I hadn't really expected when I first uh, acquired my disability. And so I started looking a little deeper into the research and finally started doing my own studies. 
which documented that there actually were some positive benefits to having a traumatic experience or what can be considered a traumatic experience, uh, whether or not it actually results in the sequelae of trauma or in what we now know as post-traumatic growth. And it was that latter emphasis on what's called post-traumatic growth that influenced uh, the later research that I performed as a graduate student at Harvard uh, for my dissertation. And I can go into that in a little bit if you'd like. Um, but basically, the premise that disability will always result in a lowered quality of life just isn't true, uh, both from my personal experience, that of my friends, but also from the research. And in fact, in one of the studies that I thought was the most telling, I compared the happiness level on every measure of happiness that's been used by scientists. So there was like 60 measures. Um, and uh, looked at who was happier, people with acquired spinal cord injuries, um, control subjects who didn't have injuries, and lottery winners. And for my study, I used people who had won over a million dollars in the state lottery. And when I calculated the statistics, there was no difference whatsoever on, on any measures of happiness, whether they took more of a pleasure-based approach or more of a meaning-based approach, there was just no difference to be found. And that does fit with my personal experience. What do you think contributed to the statistics that you were first introduced to prior to your own experience and to the studies you did? in mm -hmm. saying and in, in telling that people with disabilities have a higher rate of suicide and substance abuse? You know, that's such an interesting question and one that I've been pondering for most of my uh, life with a disability, trying to figure out what the discrepancy is due to, because I don't think that the researchers were uh, not telling the truth. I just think that it really depends on several things. One of those is the way you measure well-being. Uh, most measures are constructed for an able-bodied population um, and have a lot of assumptions laden in them. For example, quality of life studies often include things like, or questions like, uh, can you independently do your activities of daily living? For many of us, uh, we can't but that really doesn't impact our quality of life or it doesn't impact our happiness. It's just an assumption from an able-bodied population that it would, but it actually doesn't. So I think the style of the measure uh, can result in different findings. Also, the model from which one is looking uh, can determine the results. So if you start with the assumption that you're gonna find a really big difference um, in happiness, often you do, and I also think that there's very different ways or that are both models and then result in different measures. For example, uh, the two primary types of happiness that are studied in the literature today, uh, the first is hedonia. And what that is, is more of a pleasure-based happiness uh, where you're looking for high positive affect, low negative affect, and the cognitive sense of a good uh, set level of satisfaction with your life. There's another kind, however, that dates back to Aristotle, and that's called eudaimonia. What that is, is it's more based on growth and virtues and living a life of meaning. Um, and that's the kind of happiness that I think increased in my life post-disability. I feel like the meaning that I experience in my life has definitely deepened and expanded. Also, my ability to grow really has changed with a whole new lens and a new way of um, learning to do life. Um, so I think that that model of happiness is more likely to lead to uh, a lack of uh, a difference between folks who will have encountered a great adversity and those who haven't, because it is true, and I would be the first to accept that life with a disability is harder mainly because the world isn't set up for folks with disabilities. Always, you know, lack of access is a reality. Uh, buildings that don't choose to put in a ramp but choose stairs instead, that affects me. Um, all of those things can be a little bit less pleasurable, but they don't have the same impact on my level of meaning. Mm -hmm. So I think it really matters how you conceptualize happiness.
uh, and that that needs to be defined before you make claims like people with a disability are less happy. So it sounds like based on those two models, the hedonia and the eudomia, eudomia mm -hmm. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if I'm saying it correctly. That's good. But um, it sounds like there is a, a difference of like a temporary happiness, a short term mm -hmm. happiness versus yep. a long-term happiness. So um, going back to the study you did, was there a specific definition that you used for happiness? Right. Um, in the study that I did, I actually uh, used both because I wanted to do a complete test of all of the different models and all of the different measures uh, to really investigate what was going on and why it was that my own experience and that of my friends just didn't match some of those earlier medical studies. Um, and so I did test all of the different models and, and in all of them, they were equal meaning people with disability were with disabilities were as happy as those as lottery winners and as people without um, a disability and who had not won, um, which I thought was interesting because my expectation is that you might see a difference when it came to eudaimonic happiness versus hedonic happiness, um, but that actually was absent. And what I think is that um, there's just the assumption that life without what we typically define as uh, health. And as, as you and I know, and most people with disabilities, um, there is not a health problem. <laughs> there can be, you know, corresponding health problems, but disability, in my view, is an identity. It's just a way of doing life. It's a diverse form of, of doing life. And, but the assumption that uh, life will be worse if you're different is so deeply ingrained in the psyche of, and not just Americans, but folks around the world, you know, internationally as well, it's so deeply ingrained that um, the possibility for a wonderful full life post-disability uh, doesn't even seem like an option to most people, mm -hmm. but it really is. And I think it's one of those things that you have to experience to believe. You know, it's like when you lose everything you thought mattered. For me, before my accident, my athletic ability, my, uh, for most, most specifically, my um, distance running. I was in Hawaii at the time of my injury on a uh, distance running scholarship. It was a private college uh, prep academy. And I thought that was the center of my life. That was what was most important. You know, my running ability, my grades, uh, boyfriend, friends, that sort of thing. And after I was injured and lost the ability to be the type of athlete that I had before, at first I thought that really mattered. But as time went on, it really stopped mattering. I found other things that I loved just as much, if not more. And my relationships with others really deepened, uh, including my family, but also my friends. Um, the uh, level of compassion I could experience for other people's suffering had really changed. And, uh, and I was just able to see life in a, in a deeper way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what really led to my regaining my happiness after my injury. Yeah. So my own model of happiness changed, I think, post, post injury. That's so interesting. Well, you know what? Another interesting thing that you said earlier mm -hmm. that I want to dig a little deeper about is that um, it almost assumed, it, it, you almost, it was almost like having a disability not only kept you at the same level of happiness as others, mm -hmm. um, but it almost created more happiness. So the adversity, and yeah. in your case, having a disability or gaining right. that, um, mm -hmm. created more happiness. Can you speak to that? Absolutely. Um, and, and that, again, is something that I've been contemplating because uh, it's a really interesting juxtaposition to have life both become harder in a physical sense, you know, in an access way, but also uh, it appears more beautiful to me and more meaningful. And both things, even it's a dialectic, they both seem uh, to contradict each other, but they're both true at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think that when your perspective deepens, you learn that you can hold more cognitive complexity at the same time. And it's sort of like, um, like a bittersweet experience. 
you realize that like, uh, let's take a graduation, for example, it's bittersweet, right? It's both exciting and, you know, and happy because you're going to move on to something bigger and better. And at the same time, it's sad because it's an ending. And I feel that that way about disability in that it's more challenging, you know, to get into a shopping mall or to get, you know, it, it takes me longer to get into my car now, but it's also sweeter in that I feel more, more love for humanity. Uh, my life feels more meaningful. Um, I see a lot more beauty in simple things. I can appreciate a lot more. Um, so both seem true at the, at the same time. And in fact, there's a lot of studies on emotions that show that uh, pleasure and pain are not opposite ends of a continuum, but they can correspond. You can be highly happy or high, experience a lot of pleasure at the same time as you're pretty unhappy. Um, which is, you know, sort of a mind twist, but, but some things in life are just like that, you know, it's, uh, and it takes a lot of wisdom, I think, to, to realize that you can be both have experienced pain, but still be happy. You used disability as the adversity point. Mm -hmm. right. Could this also be translated to other forms of adversity? Absolutely. And that's one thing that's really exciting in the research. Since the, let's say about, um, I would say over 20 years, there's been a renewed focus on looking at what's positive in life and about humans. Um, it usually falls under the name of positive psychology. But even before it officially became a, a sub type of psychology, uh, there were several researchers, Tedeschi and Calhoun specifically, who coined the term post-traumatic growth. And since then, it's taken on different names like uh, uh, stress-related growth is one, um, benefit finding is another, but basically looking at that same concept that you take any adversity so a lot of studies on uh, survivors of cancer have been done, for example. Also, um, even things like sexual assault or combat in war, um, accidents, uh, every type of health malady have been studied with that same finding that a significant um, portion of people who experience those types of adversity report more benefits than they do uh, adverse consequences which is interesting because I think that clinical psychology and probably most of our population associated negative things with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. However, only a small percentage of people actually develop PTSD post-adversity, whereas a lot of studies show that most people or a large uh, or a plurality of people experience post-traumatic growth post-adversity. So it's actually more common to, ex to find benefits from trauma and adversity than it is to experience um, a lot of the deleterious effects. Although there's a temporal aspect to that, meaning a time-related aspect um, at first. So even uh, disability, post-acquired disability, most people do experience a decrease in happiness, you know, or the sequelae of trauma. However, with time, and it depends on the person and a number of different factors, how long it takes, people return to their uh, set point of happiness, which is sort of a genetic and environmentally influenced uh, average of happiness. And what happens in the research is that no matter how good an event is or how bad an event is, even after time, you will always return to that set point and very few things um, can, inf can change that, can change your set point. Um, some researchers have, one in particular has found that disability does change your set point for the, for the worse, but I actually disagree quite strongly with his findings because the way he operationalized disability was people who are on work-related disability and I think there's a big difference between being on disability and having a disability, you know, disability as an identity versus disability as a work-related condition. Because of course, you're gonna be less happy if you can't do what's meaningful in your life and you aren't receiving compensation and you have a, you know, a painful physical challenge. Um, you know, that makes sense. But I think that having a disability or being a person with a disability is a very different experience. 
where it's a, uh, you know, a permanent part of your identity and, and it really shapes your outlook on life and who you are as a person. Um, so I think that also explains a lot of the discrepancies in the research is the way, not just the way people just define happiness, but the way they define disability. Oh, that's, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about set points of mm -hmm. happiness. What determines our set point? You know, it's, it's interesting, uh, but a number of researchers have looked at that. And the common um, understanding right now in the research is that it's about 50% genetic. Um, so the genes that you come into life with, and then about 10% uh, circumstances um, or environment. And then 40% are things within our control. Meaning, uh, do we practice gratitude? Uh, do we have a lot of people who are close to us and who we love? Do we, are we comfortable loving and being loved? Um, do we make attempts to volunteer? Things like that that have been shown to have a lasting impact on our happiness level. Most of them we don't take advantage of though because we don't realize that they're under our control. Um, but in the, the current state of the science, that's roughly the breakdown that the researchers have found. And so if someone had a more unhappy demeanor by nature mm -hmm. um, and kind of stepping away from the science a little bit and bringing it down to the practicality of happiness, are there things that someone with, who may have a natural tendency to unhappiness be able to do to increase their happiness? I think so. I really do believe uh, that some of the latest research has uh, shown some promising avenues for increasing your set point. Um, one researcher in particular at UC Riverside in California, Sonia Lubomirsky, she's been looking at volitional activities that we can engage in that will uh, increase our set point. And one of the important variables that she's looked at is uh, variety or variability. So one of, the, uh, one of the activities that's been studied pretty commonly in the positive psychology literature is uh, called, well, we might think of it as counting our blessings or some people call it three good things where at the end of the day, you think of three good things that happened in your life or three things that you're grateful for. Um, what she's found is that if you vary it, uh, some days you do it, some days you don't, uh, some days you do more, some days you do less, that that can have a lasting impact. But what she's preventing against is what's called hedonic adaptation. That's where you get used to something. And so it no longer has an impact. And it's usually considered a good thing when it comes to negative life events. Uh, like in the case of acquired disability, people hedonically adapt after time and their set point rises or goes back to normal. But what she looks at is the fact that we do it with good events too. So even something good, like reflecting on how grateful you are for the day's events, if you get so used to it um, and you don't change it up, then you'll hedonically adapt to that exercise as well. So that's why the variable of variety has, shown, has been shown to be really important in the happiness research. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a couple of life circumstances that have been shown in the happiness research to lower one's set point that would be particularly important for people with a lower set point to avoid. And interestingly, um, one of those is commuting to work. Um, so people who have a long commute in the research, it shows that their set point lowers or gets lower and stays low until they stop commuting, meaning like change, have a change in their lives where they live closer to work or something like that. Um, and it's one of those things that seems pretty simple. Uh, most of us, you know, could probably guess, but the fact that science shows that it's that significant to our quality of life, I think is pretty important because at least here in Northern California, people commute for hours to get to work uh, versus paying more and living near closer to their workplaces. And the research would say that that's not a good idea. Wow. If you have any control over it. Another factor that's been shown to permanently lower one set point is loud, uncontrollable noises. So for example, 
probably not a good idea to live near an airport um, where there's a loud source of noise that's outside of your control. So there's little things like that that are interesting in the literature on happiness that can influ influence the choices we make about how to lead our lives that I think can have important uh, ramifications for our set point. So interesting. So people who live in the country mm -hmm. may have a higher set point of happiness then. Right. Well, you would assume that because of the lack of noise, that it would facilitate having a higher set point. And of course, what you see is that there's a lot of variability with people in the country as well as people in the city. You know, some people have a higher set point, some people have a lower set point. Um, so you see the same amount of variability in both locations. But I think what you're onto is a really good point that we can make choices about the ways we live our lives. You know, we can choose to live. Uh, in a more serene environment if we if we have that choice, if we have the financial resources. And uh, like for you, for example, you live in Hawaii, um, you know, which is a very good <laughs> choice when it comes to your set point of happiness in that it's quite serene from my yeah. memory. Yeah. Um, well, yes, it, was in, it, was, it was interesting because when we, I'm, I'm originally from the North Bay where you are now um, and uh, when we were researching about Hawaii, we got a book called, So You Want to Live in Hawaii? And uh, so they were saying that people who live in Hawaii have a five-year longer life expectancy than those on the mainland, yeah. which I thought was really yeah. interesting. So, um, you know, I I, it. yeah. And so happiness yeah. can actually affect us physically too, I think. Yes. Absolutely. It really can. And the level of for example, one of the mechanisms or routes to that is the level of stress that we um, encounter in our lives. And lowering stress, of course, has numerous uh, very impactful um, processes for our health, our physical health as well. Because um, we don't want to, if we're jacked up on cortisol all day, every day, not great for our physical health. Yeah. yeah. So if someone to were to watch this and mm -hmm. I wanted, they wanted to walk away with three things that they could do mm -hmm. to increase their happiness, what three things would you tell them? I love that question. Um, oh, what a great way to pose the, uh, how do I become happier quandary? Um, oh, okay. So the first one, and the reason I'm going to say this is that I was so fortunate when I was at Harvard to have a mentor who, uh, his name is George Valiant. He's a psychiatrist at Harvard Medical School. And he is also, uh, was one of the longest term directors of the, what is now the longest longitudinal study of adult happiness and adaptation in the world. They started, I believe, in the late 30s or early 40s, measuring the happiness level of Harvard sophomore men. At the time, it was only men. And, uh, and they followed all of those men and then added in a study with women and some lower income folks um, along the way. But they've been measuring those people every two years or so ever since. Most of them now are in their 90s or no longer living. Uh, but they've gleaned so many insights into what it takes to make a human adult happy. And so I asked George one day, um, I said, after all your years of research and also, you know, counseling people as a psychiatrist, what's the secret to happiness? And I was expecting something sort of esoteric or, you know, very lofty, but he said, other people. And I think that what he means by that is, the love that we experience from other people and also the process of loving other people. Um, it's sustaining to physical health, to mental health, uh, to having deeper, a deeper sense of social support, which is good for just about every aspect of life and really shows that investing in your relationships with other people, whether it be romantic or friendship or family is always worth it. So that's one, investing in your relationships with other people. Okay. The second thing I would say is to find something meaningful in your life. And it doesn't necessarily have to be your work or your vocation. Uh, it can be a hobby. It can be volunteer work. But something that brings your life meaning uh, or a sense of purpose, 
uh, has been shown to correlate very highly with happiness. And one of my other studies I did for my dissertation uh, looked at the contrast between money or income and meaning, a sense of having a meaningful life, and which one predicted happiness more strongly. And of course, you know, not surprising, but it was meaning. Uh, income, it's been shown, has an, Im, uh, an impact on happiness, but only up to a certain level that's lower than most of us would expect. I think in 2010, the researchers, Angus and Deaton at uh, Princeton, and I might be misquoting that, but researchers at Princeton um, found that it was $75,000 a year uh, that was after which more money didn't matter. Meaning, so if you had $75,000 a year as your income, or if you had a million dollars a year, it just didn't matter. It all washed out when it came to impacting happiness. Um, so money does have an impact, but not at the higher levels, but meaning always matters. Even if it's a little bit of meaning or if it's a lot of meaning, it really influences one's level of happiness. And third, let me think. I'm trying to compress all of my years of happiness research. <laughs> um, ooh, I would say something about giving back. And because, you know, or volunteer work, serving others, serving humanity. And I think that it is sort of an easy choice because it ties into both your relationships with other people and it ties into meaning. Because as we know, giving can be highly meaningful. It also increases your ability to connect with other people and build relationships. But I would say what I recommend to my clients now that I'm a practicing clinical psychologist is if they're having sort of an intractable depression, uh, trying to open up their worlds by thinking about others and, other, and trying to improve other people's experience of life, whether that be writing a letter to somebody, uh, like a gratitude letter, or serving food at a food kitchen. Uh, simply to take themselves out of their own minds, which is where a lot of the depression exists, mm -hmm. and broadening that perspective to include other people um, can be a really powerful intervention. So awesome. I think those are my three. Awesome. Thank Shen, you. I want to thank you so much for being here with us today. Sure. I think, um, you know, I always strive to have happiness in my life. So mm -hmm. I think these are good um beginning jumping off points for people to start practicing their happiness muscle. So yes. thank you yes. for giving us more insight into the science of happiness. Um, and I want to hear from our audience, what do you do to exercise your happiness muscle? And how does adversity affect your happiness? I would love to hear um, about your experiences in the comments below. And uh, please join us on our community at Facebook at Victoriously Living. And if you'd like to see more programs from One Leg Up Productions, please support us at patreon.com forward slash One Leg Up Productions. Thank you. And until we meet again, be happy.